Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Well, Rachel, we are closer and closer to the infamous moments where we gather with our families for this succession of indulgence, football or whatever sport you watch, and a few statements likely around the table of what you're grateful for for this year. So we're we're back into the frame of gratitude. But we're going to focus here on your family of origin and how how now how now do we fully enter into this intersection of grief and gratitude with regard to our family of origin. Let's just say it's not easy. I can tell you uh, one particular table conversation. This was a number of years ago, um, actually quite a few years ago. And our children, I don't think any of them were married at that point. And we we gathered and Becky said- I think I remember this story. And I've been like, I think I took a note like, you really have to decide if you ever want to offer that someday, yeah. many years down the road. <laughs> yeah, she she writes about this in uh, in her book, and Becky does. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. it just was disastrous. Like, let's all just talk about how grateful we are, and and especially let's be grateful for our family. <laughs> it was, oh my gosh, uh, sadly, wonderfully. Uh, you know, we've allowed our children to tell the truth, uh, at least up to a point. And they told the truth uh, about what things really broke their heart about our family. And I'm like, come on, there's a meme here. It's like, say something sappy and simple about God is good, God is great, let us thank him for this crate. I don't know. So I thought it was for food, but... It didn't rhyme. All to say, when we step into engaging our family of origin, especially if they're at the Thanksgiving Day uh, event, it's got complications. Well, I mean, this is maybe going to be a little disruptive, but I, even the concept of Thanksgiving as a holiday and the origin stories we tell about it is a story of denial and a story of idolatry. And so, so many of us are, uh, you know, about our country's origins and how everyone got together and ate around a table and there wasn't like genocide and stealing of land and lying and break, broken treaties and of people that, you know, still exist today um, and broken treaties that still exist today. And so, again, I know we've moved away from some of those stories, but I think that feels actually very familiar in our families of origin the ways in which we move towards a kind of family narrative that protects us all from entering grief and like the multiple mm -hmm. layers of grief, because, you know, we're, if we actually believe we're all sinners, <laughs> then there's no way to escape grief in, in a family. Um, and so I, yeah, I mean, we all know these ways in which grief and gratitude with our families can move in extremes. And you and I would like to encourage our listeners to avoid, to avoid being on any end of the spectrum too long between grief and gratitude. Because if the way you view your family is it's all grievous. So maybe sometimes those are the stories that are told it's all terrible. It's all bad. And there's no place for gratitude. Then that actually is not, even grief, that is probably more in the realm of like bitterness because it's a refusal to see what was good. Because if you can hold on to there was even an ounce of goodness, it will break your heart. Like where that where that could not be more of the main reality. Um, and I, I think also it's a missed opportunity 
to begin to look at how some of the brokenness is being renewed and redeemed or very at the very mm-hmm. minimum where you might be invited, might be being invited to break generational cursing on behalf of your family to, to be in some mm-hmm. ways one who leads the way into new possibilities. But if all we feel mm-hmm. If there's a profound absence of gratitude, I, it's just not, we, we will move much more towards cynicism, towards avoidance, towards hatred that keeps us safe, but still connected. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, it immediately comes to mind my, I, I, I've said many uh, times uh, that my father was a monosyllabic mm-hmm. man. Uh, a, a full sentence or two was really rare. But six weeks before he died, my father and I sat on this little concrete stoop outside his house, and it was probably close to four hours of uh, me confessing that I had really failed him as a son, and he acknowledging his own failure as a father. And he said, "I, I know you have wanted me to talk more and to tell you more about my life. And there were a, a major other things that occurred, but in this endeavor, um, I, I said, yes. I said, you you were in the first wave, or second wave at Iwo Jima, first wave at Peleliu. Would you tell me what that was like as a 19-year-old master sergeant? And my father, told me stories that um, felt like it gave me not just a taste of his life, but a world that allowed me to better understand why he lost his voice, why in some ways he refused to ever grieve uh, again. And in that sense, I would say, um, and this may sound stark, he was a good man on so many ways, but in terms of fathering me, I got fathered uh, in about four hours of my relationship with my dad. And I, 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 I can't put words to that without yeah. grief, but also such a sense of, I'm glad uh, after decades of being his son that I got four hours and four hours is not enough but it was good and so to hold that interplay of oh my gosh um you know there will be a day that uh I believe he will father me and I will be in one sense free to be fathered um but that day only has the small four grapes of taste when the banquet that I desired. And he actually set the possibility that it really could have occurred before. So there was grief and anger, but also a deep, deep sense of, oh, this is good to have. So I, I, I think it's so important to underscore grief without gratitude you know, is a refusal to honor um, how, you know, you put it so well, how even this brokenness has been part of shaping us to become who we're meant to be. But the other side is all gratitude and no grief. Oh, yeah, that's a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, and you know, I hope it's not a cheap shot, but... It's what I experience with a whole lot of evangelicals who love Jesus and do love Jesus. But it's like, God is good. God is good. God is always good. And it's like, "Uh uh-huh. Yeah, I believe that. But his son, who happens to be the second member of the Trinity, cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So even in goodness, there is something about being able to struggle and to grieve. Otherwise, it's a form of idealization that really is just another form of idolatry. And 
uh, quite frankly, I think for all of us, it's just dishonoring to what is true of who we are and the ways we're being redeemed and made whole because we all need forgiveness. So if there's no place to even begin to name where you have been in processes of forgiveness with your family, processes of repair, well, you know, I, I think then then there's such missed opportunities for real connection for gen. If, if the only way to be together is that everyone has to agree in some ways to the idolatry to not, you know, to not have any negative experiences, then you don't actually really get to bring yourself to that relationship. So, and you know, I think it's, again, do we believe in a God who promises to bring beauty from our ashes and not in a, utilitarian I'll bring you suffering so that I can bring beauty from your ashes but this promise that though that is happening on our behalf and on behalf of our families <laughs> so well I I a little aside I just had dinner last night with my oldest daughter Annie and uh this was a, a birthday present she we agreed to meet, she would take me out to eat and pay for it, which right, look, <laughs> that's fabulous. I love that. <laughs> you know, getting any getting any compensation for years, it, it's just symbolic. It's, it's you know, it's not trying to create recompense. It's just a nice taste. But what we decided to do was uh, to read a book together and engage the book over dinner and, and anything else that we wanted to talk about, and. She said, uh, I want the first book to be your new book, Redeeming Heartache. And it, it, darn it, she read the book. I didn't <laughs> actually I didn't I didn't think she would, but there there are a number of stories that I tell in the book that apparently she's mm, not heard wow. before. And uh and she brought up particularly one of me being humiliated in fourth grade with a pair of madras shorts, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, I started thinking about you as a fourth grader. And I I, I about lost it. Like just that, that sentence alone of, I thought about you, dad, as a fourth grader. And... I start tearing up immediately. And she goes, do you want me to say more or are you worried about weeping at this dinner? They're like, come on, girl. I mean, yeah, sure. So stepping into the idea that how do we look at our own parents and family of origin uh, without doing the right. two, you know, Grief without gratitude, gratitude without grief. I think we have to begin with the reality that our, our parents are sinners, just like at least I am. But that intersection of lust and anger got mm -hmm. played out uh, in some form. Uh, we don't excuse sin. Uh, the only framework for dealing with sin is forgiveness. But we also can't forgive what we don't name. And so it, it, our parents ate us, uh, that's the notion of lust. It's not just sexual. Uh, in fact, primarily, it's any desire that's mm. gone mad. Uh, and that sense of lust is always a form of idolatry. I am filling myself with something of what you can offer me. And anger is a vengeance to make someone pay for having disappointed or failed to satisfy in the way that I demand. So in that sense, Jesus ups the ante with regard to our family uh, to say, oh yeah, you were born into a family of adulterers and murderers. So have a good Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh man, that's really true, isn't it? <laughs> that Jesus really does say that oh, and understand this this part of our reality. So how do we then begin to, you know, understand this relationship between grief and gratitude as it's connected in many ways to, as you're saying, like our family of origin and to brokenness, to the brokenness in our family of origin. 
<laughs> yeah, but I'm waiting for you to answer. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Let's don't go want back to. to the story with That's Annie hilarious. because that was really sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really was. But but when when one of the things she said was, it, you spent at least in this story. Um, a lot of time being humiliated. Um, but then she said, but your mom was absorptive. So how, you know, you've been humiliated, but you were, you were fodder for her emptiness. Uh, and how, how did you, how did you live? And I looked at her and I said, Annie, come on, girl, you know, she goes, well, you are somewhat adversarial. <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> it, you're not terribly afraid of conflict. It, I am, but it doesn't look that way. And uh, it, you, you've you've been a being who's taken a lot of risks. And I, and and she was brilliant when she said, "This is the way you kept mm -hmm. your mother away." Um, and you know that. First of all, that she's thinking about me as a fourth grader, and then she's able to articulate, yeah, I can see wow. patterns today that have come out of the broken milieu of a very lustful woman who who devoured you, and a father who in some ways was too afraid to wreak revenge, but did take revenge by a form of absence. But as we kept talking, it's not like, oh, but let's look for the silver lining. It's also, you know, I, I always knew I could trust you mm. to deal with conflict. Uh, in fact, there were times where I couldn't tell you of things going on in my life because I was afraid you'd go shoot someone. <laughs> well, that's another side of, of, of the failure. But I think if we begin to, again, go back to these categories of – you are broken mm -hmm. and you are beautiful and and it, it isn't two separable realities that you can e easily distinguish it's that in so many ways you've got so much to be grateful for even in the failure of lust and anger um because in so many ways that was the soil that you came out of that's both as your parents mm. broken and beautiful so are you broken and beautiful and we can grieve the brokenness because it will one day be fully restored but do you have a place to bless which is the word gratitude are you grateful for who you became in that soil and Yes, it's complex, and it's not one or the other. It's, in some sense, grief and laughter virtually in one fell swoop. Yeah, so when we're talking about this brokenness and beauty and places where grief and gratitude you know, is intersecting in our family of origin and thinking in particular around how we make sense of the harm we've experienced in our families – you know, you've brought up these categories of lust and anger, you've named lust, you know, to help us get beyond kind of what where we go with it right away as this sense of absorption um, being used, you've named anger as this reality of vengeance and punishment, right? So how do how do we begin to get into the soil and grieve the harm that's happened and begin to name with more particularity, the gratitude we can have for when the, that brokenness is made beautiful, <laughs> is made new, how it actually does give us tremendous gifts in this world. Um, I would love to hear you put a few more words to what is true of, of absorption and vengeance, particularly in the in our families. Well, it it I think it's a, a mouthful for people to think about sitting at the Thanksgiving Day meal and going, hi, mom and dad, killer, whore. <laughs> Th yeah. Those are strong words. Uh, but if, if we can see the reality in our own life, 
without being blinded to the reality in others. Then in some sense, I think what it brings is the humility of, I, I, I need grace. I just, I, you need grace. We need grace. We need, in one sense, the rescue of God. Um, and look, there are people going to be hearing this where um, the harm your parents did uh, ain't in the realm uh, of sort of the normal fare. The harm has been so egregious and wicked, if not outright evil. And I, I don't want to, shall we say, leaven that by saying, oh, we're all sinners. And indeed we are. This is how the language of scripture is in one sense like watching somebody play tennis. Like the, the ball's got to mm -hmm. just keep going across the net. Uh, I'm a sinner. And yet uh, there's been harm done uh, to me and mine to others that's not the same. So if we can step back and let that yeah. differentiation not take away the commonality. So in that commonality to not take away the differentiation and then to be able to go, but in that leavening of we all need grace, it, it puts me at least in a position to be able to say, as I was speaking earlier, so grateful I had four hours, but mm -hmm. I'm angry. I'm angry that my father refused to engage. And yet the stories of what he suffered in World War II and after um, help me be able, not excusing, but to be able to say, this is a context to understand his own trauma and suffering with greater clarity. So I think in that sense, anytime I'm in a position of being able to name lust and anger, especially with regard to my family of origin, it puts me in the position of the simultaneity of being both harmed but also harming. And even if they're not parallel, there's enough to be able to say, am I uh, aware of the grace that I need but also the grace I've been given? Um, that allows me to begin to look at um, the portions of where I know my brokenness as a, at times, angry, risk-taking, intimidating human being has also been really used for good. So can I hold that even in grief, there has been some movement? Even my sin has been useful. I don't want to fail to profit, but even in that, there's something about God's commitment to use even cacophony to orchestrate something in the realm of glory. Uh, it, it should bring a sense of almost shock. Like, I've been used, I can be used, even as broken as I am. That's a real, I mean, I, I just feel grateful even saying it out loud. Uh, I think vengeance is harder, though. Um, when we've had people in our family who, uh, it, to some degree of consciousness, have wanted to silence us, uh, to hurt, to hurt us, um, how do we actually find any sense of gratitude in that? And uh, uh, to put simply, I, I think um, it it creates a defiance, even if the defiance is subtle or very overt, you know, when you are facing injustice, and that's what vengeance is, uh, it's a, a form of mm. deep injustice. There's something inside that rises up and goes, hell no. Uh, and that deep sense of, I will stand against that which is not meant to be, uh, is a really beautiful part of um, protest. So where you have been able to move into a hell no protest, a defiance that says, I will not let you take me under. I will not let you take my breath away. You know, and as I think about your lovely life, my dear friend, it, you're 
defiance is stunning. Yeah, I mean, I th- I think that that um, those places of defiance against being bound by lust and anger, whether that's in our families, in our communities, in our culture, in our country, um, I think it is where we join Jesus in the groaning uh, for justice and mercy. And so where we can, f- and, and I think it is grief that actually invites us into these places where we have been absorbed, where we have experienced vengeance that really is not even about us. Like it's might be being enacted upon us in our family of origin, but it's rarely actually about us. Grief of these places can actually liberate us to a different kind of freedom that we really can't and shouldn't be anyone's God where, where absorption has tried to say, I need you to be my life. Like we are human size and we actually are not. Jesus has taken on (laughs) the powers of sin and death. Jesus has taken on all cursing. Jesus has taken on all burdens. Um, We are not bound by other people's vengeance and we are not bound to join them in their vengeance. And so I think that's where we get into this kind of, why are we connecting grief and gratitude? What is the invitation with grief when we think about our family of origin that maybe provides a different path to dealing with our like parents' harm? Well, uh, it, this is where I, I'm going to turn back to you in terms of the intersection of clean versus dirty pain. Well, I mean, even that language of clean pain and dirty pain is coming out of Resma Menicum's uh, work, uh, My Grandmother's Hands, where he is talking about trauma and specifically racialized trauma of our bodies and how that plays out. And this notion that we actually have to differentiate between clean pain and dirty pain. And, th- and grief invites us to, I would say, more of the possibility of clean pain. Uh, It's a restorative pain. It's a pain that actually is a part of a process that has the capacity to bring us home to our bodies, to give us imagination for what repair can look like, even if the people we need to repair with are no longer living or are not capable of providing that repair. Whereas dirty pain actually comes when we refuse to enter grief. So we're guarded with all of our coping mechanisms that try to keep us from experiencing pain but we actually just kind of recreate pain after pain after pain, because to avoid pain like that, you actually have to become someone who harms other people. And even in your denial of that. So I think that the capacity to grieve what we have suffered, to grieve the broken relationship, to grieve brokenness invites us to begin to not be bound by that brokenness and to see where redemption is possible um, again, whether there's repair of relationship or not. Indeed. Uh, it, so as we focus finally on like your Thanksgiving Day meal, I'm not sure it's the best time to talk about lust and anger and adultery and murder. Uh, but you can go a little further than, I'm so grateful that God has forgiven me. Um, it might be a sentence like, I'm so grateful, as our family knows. Uh, I can be fearful and uh, make a lot of demands. And I'm grateful not only to God, but I'm grateful to you, family, for not only knowing that, but engaging that with me. I want to be a better man. So our our hope for you with regard to this uh, is like a sentence, maybe two, that allows you to enter into this really remarkable ritual of mm-hmm. holding Thanksgiving as the gift of of being able to own the goodness of what we have been given and the goodness of whom we're with. Can we indeed find a way to bring the reality of grief into a conversation, into public statements around the table, um, in a way that people can now begin to go, what? What? What did he say? Uh, that would be a remarkable turkey for people to eat. It be so. The 
Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.